So. Hi everyone, welcome to this webinar on CICD security. My name is Alex Jones. I'm the tech lead for the CNCF. I also work as an engineering director at Canonical and I deal with all things Kubernetes. Uh, today, I have Ben Hirschberg who's joining me as CTO at Armo, and I'll let Ben introduce himself before we go further. Hi everyone, it's great to be here. Um, I'm Ben, as Alex said, I'm CTO of Armo and maintainer of Kubescape. Uh, we are working on Kubernetes security solutions here. So I'm pretty excited to start to talk about securing CI CD pipelines. Well, I'm really excited because it's not every day that I get a chance to sit down with somebody and talk about things that often are just beyond um, the curve. I think of most engineers who are getting up and running uh, with, with security solutions particularly in cloud native environments. So I'm excited to have you uh, with me, Ben. Um, and actually I thought one of the first things we could talk about are the trends that are changing in the cloud native ecosystem. So if I share my screen for a moment and I hope everyone can, can see this clearly, you know, five, 10 years ago, we had this very simplistic model of development test and prod in terms of uh, environments, right? And we, we had gating at the time, but for folks who have worked uh, in banks or in large enterprises, you, you may well be familiar with these gates being things like ServiceNow, right? And it may be a ticket that goes to an external service. Um, and that, that creates a, a few bars, right? Because often these systems that they go out to will require some sort of manual intervention. They may well be arbitrary. And in the, in the context of security, they don't mean a great deal, right? It, it would typically be, has a dev team submitted the right paperwork to progress to this environment. And also, what does that mean, right? With the dawn of with uh, OCI, so um, with, with images that are being produced like a Docker image, we have an artifact that would go across these environments. But prior to that, there would have been a rebuild or possibly even artifacts that were dependencies that were rebuilt across these environments. So we've solved a lot of problems in the past few years in terms of the provenance and the artifacts. But we still see that many companies are struggling to provide these this kind of high quality gating, but bring it into the into the modern era. So you'll see that there are folks that have kind of automated gates that can check for things such as does the liveliness probe work? Can I can I spin it out? So an automated gate might do a bunch of stuff. You know, it might might do some tests, right? It might run some unit tests. It might run some integration tests. But very rarely do we see automated gates. Um, that run any form of security testing, right? So, and live security testing. So I'm really interested as well, just before I get any further down this path, um, to know sort of your thoughts, Ben, in terms of if you take the kind of typical CI CD approach and you apply it to the cloud native ecosystem, what are your thoughts in terms of are we creating a larger attack surface these days? And do we have more people working in the space? What are sort of some of the trends that you think? are starting to emerge right now? And what are your customers and, and users telling you? So, yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, as of today, we are we are really living a new world, okay? And and some of us even start to forget what was the old world, but but really today, the you know, the speed, the way we are, you know, we are deploying things are, 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 have, are changing and have already changed. So, if, you know, as a technological leader of a, of a company, okay, I'm talking to, you know, other, uh, you know, technological readers of other companies. And, and you know, every, uh, I noticed that, uh, like, in the last two years, everyone is telling that how everyone's saying to the other, well, we are deploying uh, new, new things in our production, like, 10 times a day, uh, or, or 100 times a day, or even, you know, more. And and this becomes some kind of a, you know of a, of a badge of a good work that we are able to deploy things very fast in our production. But from a security perspective, you know, it raises a lot of questions. Okay, um, as you know, infrastructure as a code and uh, you know evolve, and the way we are pushing changes is not just touching only the software itself, but also the infrastructure around it and the Kubernetes. Uh, is you know is in this case part of the infrastructure. 
Um, it raises a lot of security questions, okay? Because, you know, theoretically those who are, who are pushing these changes into our Git repos, right? Are, are have a specific, you know, uh, um, um, uh, roles in the company and may, their main role is actually, is not necessarily security, okay? And, and it raises the questions, okay, then who's looking after security? So in this environment, okay, because we are really uh, looking, putting uh, the developers and DevOps engineers in the focus of, of, of these deliveries. And, and, and this requires, you know, a specific skill set, a specific understanding of security or understanding what is, doing, what is good and what is uh, bad for security. And, and, you know, usually as a security engineer myself, you know, originally I can say that nothing is good enough for security, okay? So therefore we need to, we need to understand beyond, uh, do some prioritization among the bad things. So, um, so I think that the, that the skill is need to be there and we have to have some kind of an answer of automatizing, you know, the security part mm -hmm. okay, of this delivery pro process. and. And, and and sometimes you know I, I'm telling my friends that that if I'm looking uh, into the GitHub actions of, of actual projects today, I can see that they're they're using uh, spell checkers, okay, uh, in in, uh, in their GitHub actions to approve new code into the into their project, but then they are not using anything any security tooling, so. Mm -hmm. And and I myself who's you know, for me, good spell checking is really important. Okay, and I get annoyed. Okay, by by that spelling, I can still think, think that if I need to prioritize two things, I'm I'm going to automatize my security first and just after the spell checking, right? So yeah. uh, so I think that and that's really, that's really interesting, right? Like how they 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 feel as if they're enabled enough to put a spell checker in, but they don't feel as if they're enabled enough to put security tooling in simply, right? Right. So yeah. So I think that the importance of of putting security uh, uh, gates into our processes, into these uh, 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 you know um, areas, is 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 really important. Okay. So to to be able to keep up with the velocity while while we are you know thinking or less concerned about secure the security aspects of of this velocity. Is is going to be you know um, as we are evolving in the cloud native environment and and, and these processes is going to be you know a paramount thing okay otherwise we'll get lost in this part. And and you hit upon something that's really interesting there and I just um, updated my my diagram to show it but we've moved from the old world of it being kind of fire and forget to now this idea of continuous deployment right. And you'll see lots of diagrams similar to this that kind of look like a, a wheel, right? Because it's going round and round. But this idea that you can now take something locally and like you say, Ben, have it in production the same day is pretty crazy. And you know, developers are looking at real-time signals from their production environments, making tweaks locally and then deploying out. And so to my point a bit facetiously here about using ServiceNow or some other old school method for gating, they're just not adequate and they only compound the fact that security is not at the forefront of those of those thoughts. So I think it's really, really interesting because, you know, as we start to increase that velocity, there are certain industries that just won't participate in continuous deployment until they have a risk profile analysis uh, before they deploy into their target volume, right? Whether that's Kubernetes or on a VM or a, or a function, right? They, they have certain regulatory and governance requirements. That means they have to do due diligence to make sure they're not regressing on data being exposed, you know, on some, some control that's not being met. And so, you know, that's where, you know, I was really interested in the, the stuff that, um, that, that the folks at Cubescape are, are doing and partially to facilitate that conversation. I just want to take you folks through a really simple example. So. You know, the idea that most people are working in a GitOps pattern is not completely accurate. However, it does certainly represent the future that a lot of people are trying to move towards. To, to give you an example, I've got a really simple repository called cats, right? It displays pictures of cats, right? Um, it's not super, super complicated, but it is representative of a common pattern where engineers will build 
the code in the repository, but then they will also have the templates in that repository as well for that code. I think a lot of people have tried different patterns, such as having your Kubernetes manifest in one directory, having it in another, having a different repo. But I commonly see there is an amalgamation of code and templates for that. What is interesting though, is that even in this world, there is um, opportunity to do better because I can cut a release and I can deploy that out very, very easily and very rapidly, right? If I've got permissions for my work, let's say I'm at a mega corp and I can produce a microservice and I have committer um, permissions, what that also means is that it will build an image of that, those commits. And it's quite easily for me to go to production. So with very little thought, one single error in this cats repository can be deployed out through a GitOps paradigm into my production environment in minutes or if not, if not seconds. And so I think that only exacerbates the need for not only gating, but continuous scanning. I mean, how, how, how what are your thoughts, Ben, on sort of moving towards a GitOps pattern? Do you, it's obviously a good thing, but it does come with some dangers, right? With great power comes great responsibility, right? Yeah, and, and, and it is, you know, um, this obviously, you know, the security gating also around GitOps and the weight that things are getting into production systems or, or not even production systems. I can tell you that, that from our research, we are seeing that the law of staging and development systems are also public facing in the internet. So this means that that attackers can get there. So um, so production uh, getting into these environments uh, 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 is you know is something that obviously you know attackers are really looking for uh, for different reasons. Okay, uh, you know we can talk about you know uh, these reasons for a long time. Okay, but if I really want to you know boil it down to you know um, a few thing a few points okay attackers are looking for you uh, take your data uh, attackers are, are, are looking for to destroy you know uh, 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 either your services or your data behind your the services in in, in order to uh, you know to cause you downtime or attackers are look, simply looking for you know to to take you know your cloud account and and start to Use it for their own own good, um, and and you know therefore GitOps is is has obviously um uh, um you know very some very concerning you know uh, um uh, dimensions where where we have to look after okay what is get, really getting into the our Git if once we had to look in into what was going into uh, you know our production system. And we did it with, you know, looking at the actual, you know, packages you've been telling before, okay, in the old school that we're looking, okay, preparing some installation package and and in this installation package, okay, the security engineer, we're looking, going through it. Uh, now we need to, uh, we need to be sure that, that, that the, actually the, the interface with our production system is not the API server of the production uh, uh, Kubernetes, but actually your interface with your production is is your Git repo or or the, your main branch, and therefore this is the place where you have to you know look at where what is getting in there, and and honestly you know um, your you know uh, your drawing made me think okay of another interesting thing that that the, uh, not just actually what is getting into from a security perspective what is getting into your production, but also the time you need to fix it in the old world okay as you told that we are we were opening a service now ticket or another ticketing system you're opening up tickets and you know uh, uh pushing your uh, you know your changes through the whole uh whole organization um today you know uh this tooling enables you to find out security issues not just earlier to prevent uh, to to, uh, not to let these issues going into your production, but you it, it can give you also already a feedback very early, okay, in the production phase. It means that as you as a developer, you as a DevOps engineer, can get an instant feedback, okay, about your changes, and you can solve it right away, okay, in your pull requests, for example. And it also makes in in one hand these new processes are 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 
concerning for a security perspective, but in, in general, it can lower your costs, okay? Because it, it go, these processes are, can make, give you feedback much earlier. I think there's a lot of wisdom there. I was, I was making some notes on my document, as you can see. It's interesting because if you think about it, what you've described there is the lens is shifting, isn't it? We're right. moving to here, right. We're moving to this place on the left over here uh, from the right. So for those folks who maybe aren't familiar with GitOps, think of it this way. Again, the, the Kubernetes cluster itself runs a process. Um, there are several out there. I've got one running here for my, for my demo. That process synchronizes to your Git repository and to your artifacts, right? It pulls them in rather than pushes them from the CI CD. But as Ben described, what's really interesting is that you can now, with the right tooling, start to identify things that are going to be a problem later on before they become a problem. So you're not actually looking at here anymore. So that's kind of where the old pane of glass used to be for security. So where security used to be. And then where security is moving, right? It's starting, I should say. And that's really interesting because I was having a play around with um, Cubescape. And if you looked on my screen in the background, what I've done here is I've installed through the marketplace on my VS code. I just went and grabbed it before this little call. And I was like, hmm, what can I show off? And so as a, as a previous cluster admin, you know, in many, many roles, um, one of the big problems that people often put on is host networking, set to true which gives you certain um, certain routing capabilities and access to uh, IP address ranges. And what's interesting with this is that an engineer might just turn that on because they copy paste it out of a, a document or a guide. They don't really know what's going on. And what's really cool is that I get this pop-up that starts to tell me, hey, you might want to think about not doing that because it's going to inherit the access of the entire host network. And if you if you look further into that, it talks about the remediation. And I think this is really interesting. And I, I guess this is a question for you, Ben, but it feels to me a lot like you're coming from a developer experience first perspective on this. Was that an intentional thing or was that an organic thing? Like, did you decide, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a project, this is something we want to target because if we make it simpler for people to understand then they're more likely to use it. So, um, yeah, I have to tell you that, that, that the, the, how we started the Cubescape project, it was really, you know, um, from a developer perspective and not just developer per se, but also operations, SREs, DevOps. Um, we really were thinking about, you know, not the classical security persona in, in the organization, okay? Because we understand that, that today, just as you, you know, you draw it up here that actually the the the, the you know the, the way that the world has shifted in into the direction of where the things are happening really and where the things are really happening is is around the code and around what developers and devops are doing therefore when we created this project okay we decided to, to target Actually, both personas, okay? We are not saying that we are against any security persona uh, here, but but uh, uh, we've we've really targeted the developers and DevOps, okay? And enable them to, uh, you know, with the same engine, okay? Uh, as you would, you know, scan for security issues, your cluster, you can scan the Kubernetes objects you're creating even before and just as you shown in, in the in the VS Code uh, plugin example, already in the develop uh, uh, in the development phase, uh, to show you these issues, raise these issues, and you know going from the developer phase to the other gates to the other phases, you you would have the same uh, same engine. Okay, if we are talking about uh, between engineers. Okay, you are taking the same engine through the whole process. And this enables you a lot of good things. Um, and not just, you know, showing early these issues, but you can synchronize actually your, your expectations across, you know, the whole uh, left to right pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I can imagine that if I was to copy this to my security team and they used a different type of scanner, then it's almost like you're wasting that effort having to translate one thing to the other. And so that was really cool because 
before this, um, we set this webinar up, I was playing around and I built um, an action based off the docs from Cubescape to do uh, image scanning, um, to, uh, misconfiguration scanning. And what was really cool, well, I'll show you what was cool, is I was able to just add it into my workflow as an engineer. So if we can imagine that this was my my local directory, you know, I'm cutting my code and I create that new PR, um, what was really fun is that it it adds itself in as a check and I can actually see to, if there's a, if there's a, there's a misconfiguration, you know, in my code. Um, and what's also interesting is I believe that then there's, there's a way to, to tailor that, isn't it? You've got a couple of methods. It's like thresholding, there's exceptions. I mean, do you want to speak a little to how, you, how that would work in reality? Because I know that in a real world, no one's going to get rid of every problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so actually two, you have as, you know, what we're talking about right now is using Cubescape as part of GitHub Action in, as part of a security gate. What kind of code is, uh, what kind of codes you are accepting into your, your cluster? Okay, or sorry, not into your Git repo. Okay, and eventually into your cluster. So uh, you can have different approaches, okay? Solving, okay, that what are you doing with these issues you are seeing, okay? Here, you can say, on the one hand, that well, okay, I'm Cubescape is generating uh, uh, an overall risk score, which is, um, you know, we could hold a webinar about how this risk score is calculated. But the rule of thumb, okay, you could say that check what is your current risk score uh, and say, well, okay, I don't want to go below this risk score. Okay, so you would use this score as an a, as a threshold. And you have a common uh, argument in, in in the GitHub action for for applying that. This is one uh, one approach. Another approach is that well, you know, I'm fine with accepting uh, uh, you know uh, low risk uh, issues into my uh, in, into my repo. And every like every issue, you know, Cubescape is really uh, raises has you know this severity uh, uh, scoring. Okay, of of uh, critical high medium low and and you could say that I'm okay accepting low issues but I don't want to see high and critical or I'm even also fine with with medium issues and this was caused the the you know the PR to fail if someone introduces a high or critical right. issues but I think that um, that yeah sorry finish, please finish your thought so there is another way that that you can with Cubescape, and I think it's very very powerful tool to create what we call exceptions. Like you know, you're saying that well, Cubescape is checking uh, whether I, I my deployments are doing uh, using the Linux hardening capabilities. Okay, which you have you know shown just uh, on the screen before, and you can say well, I'm fine with uh, with this. I'm I'm not really you know. Uh, concerned about this issue and 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 you can create the exception in a simple JSON file and keep it in your the same repository okay so as part of uh, you know of the PR processes someone can either solve their issues or can add the specific issues into the exception file and say well this is something I'm okay with and these are the three ways yeah, presumably, presumably presumably if you're running through CI CD, your security team could actually keep their own exceptions repository, right? right? So you actually have this ability to have a separate type of persona who's managing exceptions. So I can't just go and bypass them without talking to somebody, right? Right. So this is, I think that this is the most mature, mature, uh, you know, approach. Okay, that's really you know to to split, you know, the ownership. Okay, in this case, and have you know the security team to 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 uh, create these exceptions. Um, uh, but uh, but it might turn out that uh, you know actually the security team will also you know manage it as part of the Git, okay? And it's really depends it depends on your organization and your you know the way you're working. Um, but you know Cubescape enables you to to handle uh, according to how you would like to work, okay, and define your workflow. I, I suppose what for me as uh, an engineer. I find most appealing is that because it's built, you have the ability to use the action and you've got the local experience, you are being told quite clearly several times, like there are misconfigurations. So developers can no longer claim 
ignorance, right? Like, oh, I just put this thing in so that when you get a massive, um, you know, vulnerability report come in at the cluster level, you had plenty of opportunities prior to that, right? And I guess that takes us to the third part of this, isn't it? Is that we've described um, how you do a lot of the shift left. So you've got the local config that's being checked. We also have then the ability to run it in the CI CD. So CI CD in this uh, scenario I've described as sort of my GitHub action, yeah. you know, run um, remote checks. And then you, at this point, let's say you've gone through both of those, and that's not really the end of the story, is it? Because as an engineer and, and as a sysadmin, I still need to make sure, I, and even as a security expert, I need to make sure I have continuous scanning in the cluster. Like, I know that you folks have an offering for that as well. Talk me through a little bit about how that works, because, you know, I've, I've played with it, but I'm not an expert. Yeah. So, um, so we're really in the Cubescape project. We are targeting for the whole range. Okay. Um, you know, at the end, um, and I'm I'm a big fan of GitOps, okay. But at the end, okay, you need to you know you need to also look into what is actually happening, okay, in your in your your actual production environment, um, and therefore you know there are two ways to to use Cubescape or you know other tooling, okay. You can scan Cube API, okay, with the same CLI tool uh, we are releasing. Uh, uh, and and you know see the same issues also in your production environment in case you haven't fixed them uh, before. Uh, and the other option is to install Cubescape as part of of your cluster. You can install it. You, you have a you know a, a simple Helm chart installing it as a microservice. And in this case, the uh, the Cubescape microservice will monitor. Okay, uh, uh, your your production environment. It will uh, monitor. Okay, uh, your your Cube API and will check. Okay, every once in a while that how you know your deployments, your Kubernetes objects are are looking like. And it also uh, um, it will also scan you know the vulnerabilities in your your images, and and eventually okay will as the project. Our project is progressing. Okay, we'll connect even more data feed uh, uh, data streams to uh, uh, to Cubescape to check uh, to make a better prioritization of your issues and maybe find issues, uh, security issues we haven't, you know, we cannot detect through Cube API or image vulnerability scanning. And as of today, there are two directions. Okay, to take this data from. Okay, one is that you are using it as a standalone uh, project in your cluster. Uh, and in this case, you can visualize the results with uh, with Prometheus. Uh, and we we can export the data into Prometheus, and and from there you can take it into Grafana or or to with other integrations. And um, and we have our uh, uh, Armos Cubescape cloud offering, okay, where we are freely you can push your your data there. And you can do the monitoring uh, uh, view uh, from this, uh, you know, from this SaaS, and you can look into. And I think yeah, that's super worth. That's worth talking about, right? Because right. when I started, when I when I installed the Helm chart and I got up and running, I instantly realized that it was at that point in time the personas who can have access to this now far exceed kind of just your engineer who's working down in the weeds. In the CI CD logs or on a local system, right? Right. One of the things that I was first drawn to was the ability to have um like stuff like visualization, right? So you you obviously spend a lot of thought on who these personas are. I mean, for me, one of the things that relating back to my previous experience, I would have loved is for other people from other teams to be able to look at this data. And I notice as well with things like registry scanning and image scanning. There are other features that you can leverage as well to make sure that more of your estate is, is kept in good hygiene and outside of just a one repo, right? I really like that. Right. Um, you know, I, I, from from your perspective, you know, these are these are kind of things that I think are super useful to have continuously working. Do, do you see um, do you see kind of like the CI CD process is just the beginning, and this is more of the of the kind of where the the heavy continuous uh, workloads are going to go? So people will spend more time 
looking at the results from scanning? Or is it going to be kind of like, as you said before, they'll get an alert or a pop-up in, you know, whatever they used saying, hey, something's changed. Like, I guess that's a big question, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, you know, there. this is really about, you know, split of ownership some uh, and, and making our work, you know, the most effective collectively, you know, as, uh, as an organization or trying to deliver not just functionality, but deliver the functionality in a secure manner, okay? Um, and, and you know, there are, are really two kind of personas here. You, you know, one of the dev who is, who is in charge of, you know, delivering the code, and the other is the, you know, I would say the security engineer or, or, or those who are tasked with, with, the, with the security, okay, of, uh, of you know, the infrastructure and, and, and the whole solution. Uh, because uh, because they still need to have uh, a tool where they are seeing the whole system through uh, uh, um, from the security perspective, okay, and and this th this part, okay, of the of of the solution, okay, is really more talking to them, okay, that that the monitoring part, okay, that whether something that may, might have slipped through the cracks or or something that wasn't delivered in uh, through the right channels are, are, are getting into uh into the production it, it, there you, you know you can't you cannot say as a security engineer that well um someone was able to to deliver to the to our production not through the git gitops therefore this is not my problem okay obviously the security engineer will look at the actual uh, you know, production system, and he needs to monitor it. And but having said that, okay, and and I I really you know believe in that that even in this case, uh, when the security engineer identifies some issue in the production system, uh, we believe that uh, that uh, that they need to be able to talk the same language as you said before with the yeah. developers. Right, so th they need to able to point them in the right direction. It, it it has to be a very, very short, uh, um, you know, circuit of discussion. Okay, here to be able, so they have the same language, they have they see the same issues, and 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 this is you know the direction we are be we believe in. It's interesting, and I'm smiling because it's detected that one of my own repositories, one of my own. Uh, pieces of code has vulnerabilities in it, which is really funny, um, which I'm sure it does. So if we go to, this is actually a good proof because we go to Watchman, which is a project I've just been writing for KubeCon, and we go to the Go mod, um, there, there is a vulnerability in one of the um, one of the libraries that I'm using in here, which is the Prometheus client. And uh, it's quite cool. So I think it's this one here, this client Golang Prometheus. Yeah. Um, and it's quite cool. It's, it's, picked, it's picked that out. And it's also identified that it's related to a um, a particular CVE. So, you know, I had no idea. And of course, now knowing this, uh, I'm going to go do a go get upgrade or I'll go think about what I'm importing into my images. So right. already, you know, I think even as an individual user, it does make me more conscious. And in, I think what's interesting is, you know, we look at the checks on GitHub and we use this as like a marker of of uh, prestige right like all the tests pass everything's beautiful all the linting passes we should be thinking about that about security as well right so that all of the tests uh and on and the controls that are being tested should also pass and you should feel good about that right and i think that is the way that we make this work is that we design this to i don't want to say gamify it but we certainly make it something that people feel proud about right that they consider that as a you know, just think about five, 10 years ago, testing was such a hard thing to get people to consider, right? But now we've had an explosion of quality and testing. And now we consider it as a first class, you know, piece of our, our consideration when we're building software. It should right be the same for security. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that that really you pointed in the, into one of the most both beautiful things, okay, of this, that, that, that once that, that you know, Something like twenty years ago, okay, or and no, people were less thinking, okay, of of security and and testing as as being a, you know, a fancy thing, okay, 
And I think that that I always said to myself that as an engineer, okay, when I felt that I wasn't challenged enough, okay, I found something to make make ourselves more effective and more interesting of uh, for example of through automation okay automating okay the way we work and and, and and you know the things which are not challenging okay let's save time on that and and and, and make them more so this is really what's happening today in the sense that that today not just you know unit testing and component automatic component testing and so on you know, integration testing is 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 has evolved but also the security tooling around automation has evolved and, and, and you really can automate very, uh, I can say boring stuff also uh, uh, and, and make them you know interesting and work fast and create a more quality of work as a developer uh, as before. You've reminded me of a, um, of a maxim that I once heard and that is create a pit of success. You know, you want to make it so people fall into it and it's super easy. And I think you you folks are, are on, on the right track there. And what's awesome is that people can go off and try this, right? Because it's all it's all available on GitHub and you can play around with it and join the community. And which reminds me, I have a final slide. Uh, so that if you are interested in using um, Cubescape or chatting to these folks, check the QR code, visit their GitHub. Equally, my, uh, my, my Twitter or Ben, is also equally, I'm sure, happy to answer questions. Uh, but I think that's that's a wrap for today, right? I think that's yeah. everything. That's real wrap. I think that and and you know, Cubescape is an open source project. It's a co it's a community driven project, and, and and you know, we are really looking forward for you know for any feedback, okay, or, or contributions, and joining our, our community. I think that we are making something really interesting. Awesome. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.